to be a little confused and you can be a little bit confused. But it's a confused and confused. The spin, okay. The other part over here, 40 days and nights, it was rain. So then what's going on over here? So if you read the passage, basically it's starting a new story at verse 6. That's the idea. So then verse 1 through 5, there are two possibilities. 1 through 5 is giving one account of when the waters, they abated and they decreased. And then verse 6 is giving a different account. Okay? So it's repeating the same story of uh, verses uh, 1 through 5, but dip, uh, giving a different account. It's like Jesus' story where you have four different accounts. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. So there are different accounts, different viewpoints to it. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that, notice the Bible says, it came to pass at the end of 40 days, right? It never said that right after 40 days. No, it says the end of 40 days. So you can do it uh, 150 days later or however long you want. The point is, is if the 40 days of the flood ended, what happened, right? So that's the point, the end of 40 days. So if it's talking about the end of 40 days, then that means basically when uh, 40 days ended, then you can go as far as you want because how long is that ending? So you can go as far back as you want to. So that would solve about uh, one so-called uh, contradiction that uh, you would see in the account of Genesis. Okay, so we're going to look now at uh, Genesis chapter 8 again. The Bible reads here, It came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. So remember, there is one window in Noah's ark. So the Bible says that uh, Noah opened the window of the ark that he made. Verse 6, the beginning, notice this, it came to pass at the end of 40 days, right? So that shows you a different account or what happened at the end of 40 days. It came to pass. Usually when you look at that phrase in your Bible, it came to pass, it's beginning a story, right? Yeah. So that's uh, evidence right here at verse 6. When it says, and it came to pass at the end of 40 days, it doesn't necessarily have to be right after 40 days of the rain. It's just giving a different uh, spin of the story. Like, sometime after 40 days, right, came to pass, what happened, so that's the idea. We're going to look now at verse 7. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro. So notice that Noah, he sent forth. 
he sent out a bird, a raven. And this raven, the Bible says it went uh, forth to and fro. Basically, that's an English phrase. It went everywhere. Until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So the raven was going back and forth everywhere. Until when? Until he was just going everywhere until the waters, they dried up from off the earth. So remember that when we look at verse 3 here, so let's not get confused. At 3 and 4, the Bible says the waters return from off the earth continually, right? So that doesn't mean that it's completely dry land yet, all right? At verse 3 and 4. Remember, the tops of the mountains were being seen, right? So it's the tops of the mountain. That doesn't mean that the waters were completely away from the earth. You'll notice right here, verse 7, the wording is different. The waters were dried up from off the earth. So it shows right here that the raven, he was just flying everywhere until when? Until the waters were dried off from off the earth. That's a different wording from verse 3 and 4. The waters were being dried continually. Okay, so it's a drying process. Because remember this, you got a couple hundred feet of water, all right? We're talking about like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousand feet of water. So that's going to take a lot of time, obviously. So there's plenty of time for water to dry off. The drying off can be a long length of time. That's important to understand. Atheists, they don't really understand their Bible. So they, when they see water dry off from the earth, they automatically assume, oh, it just, what, shrunk, what? That don't even sound scientific, you dumb atheist, you who brag about science. Yeah. How can you get the water dry off like hundreds, thousands of feet, like, boom, like that, evaporate or something like that? It takes long days, weeks, and months, okay? So when they read water dried off, they automatically assume, oh, it's dry. No, it don't work that way. It takes a long length of time for drying. Now, the raven is a type of an unclean bird. Look at Leviticus chapter 11. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter 11. The Bible shows that the raven is an unclean bird. And if you know your Bible, the Bible talks about... That fowls are likened to, do you know what they are? Fowls are likened to, if you recall your Bible, they're devils, right? Yeah. If you recall that in your Bible. So we'll just take it as it is. I'm not going to uh, show you verses on that one, okay? But we know that fowls, that they're likened to devils. So if they're likened to devils, and then the bird is an unclean bird, right? That's like an unclean spirit. So, the raven is perfectly a good type of devil, so to speak. All right, we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 11. And notice what the Bible reads about the unclean birds. It gives a list of all sorts of unclean animals. Look at verse, 15, uh, verse 13, verse 13. Mm -hmm. And these are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. Who is included here? Verse 15. Every raven after his kind. So notice right here that they are the fowl of abomination. But let's look at Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Notice that God says abomination and fowl. And those are devils, all right? Those are devils. Look at the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Abomination foul, and God says those are devils. All right, look at Revelation, chapter 18. Look at verse 2, verse 2. All right, go to Revelation, chapter 18. And then uh, we'll look at verse 2, okay? All right, if your hand's over there, notice that the Bible reads. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is, and is become the habitation of devils. See that? Mm -hmm. And the whole of every foul spirit, and a cage of every what? Mm -hmm. Unclean and hateful bird. Mm -hmm. Right? How about that? 
And that's part of Babylon, right? Yeah. Babylon is the mother of abominations when you look at chapter 17, verse 5. Chapter 17, verse 5. Mm, that's good, that's good. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and what? Abominations of the earth. So there is no doubt the raven is undoubtedly a type. It's a picture of devils. There's no doubt about that. Okay, let's go back to Genesis, all right? Go back to Genesis. And I want you to go to Job 1. <clears throat> go to Job 1. It's very clear from Scripture. It's very clear from Scripture that the raven, the bird here, is representing Satan or the devils. All right, look at Job 1. And then I want you to turn to the book of Genesis. Return to Genesis. Now look at that at Genesis again, okay? The Bible talks about that raven. When you look at that same passage we left off, what does it say? It went to and fro, right? So it was going to and fro all over the earth. Wow, that's definitely, go to Job 1. What did Satan do? He went to and fro the earth, walking up and down on it. See, so that raven is definitely a picture. It's a type of the devil. Let's look at Job chapter 1. There's too much wording in Scripture here that shows it. Look at Job chapter 1 verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay, let's return to Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. And then we'll look at verse 8. Genesis 8, 8. Now there's the dove. There's the dove. All right. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 8. Also he sent forth a dove, because remember that raven did not return at verse 7, right? The raven just went out, went to and fro the earth. Why? Because it's uh, picturing the devil just going to and fro the earth and not returning back to help humans. All right? So unclean spirits, they don't want to help mankind, obviously. They just want to leave them out to die. That's the devil's purpose. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit's purpose is to help out humans. Right. And that's the dove. The dove, yes. so Noah sends out the dove to find out signs of dry land, whereas the raven won't do that. The raven just bailed out on mankind. The devil will always bail out on you. And I think that should be a lesson right. for you. Yeah. When there's an unclean spirit behind every sin and temptation you go through, remember this, they don't care about your life. They could care less. They want you to be hurt. They will just leave you out to die. And the devil and Satan will bail out on you. I don't understand why you trust the devil yeah, so much. That's good. Why do you trust the devil so much and you play along with his lust? The Bible says you are of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. You trust him too much, right? A good picture also over here is that Noah, uh, why didn't he send out the dove first? Why did he send out the raven first? You know what that's a good picture of? We tend to trust more, and the first reaction is on the devil more than the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Come on. Wow. Yeah. wow. That's our tendency. All right, you can preach a sermon off of this one. All right, let's go to Genesis 8.8. 8. So you can guess, obviously, I gave you the answer, is that there's a difference with the raven and the dove. So I don't know if these words are big enough because we zoomed out, so please let me know, okay? So I don't know if they can see this word right here. So please let me know about that. So uh, notice right here that the raven, all right, if the word is big enough for them to see, that uh, did it bail down on Noah, the dove, Noah sent it out. And let's see what the dove does. Verse 8, also he sent forth a dove from him. So Noah sent out, he sent forth that uh, dove, away from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground so that the dove can go out and see if the waters they reduced they were abated from the face of the ground so that there is dry land verse 9 but the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot so then the dove she was uh, she wasn't able to find rest for her feet she couldn't land safely now that raven bailed out, and that raven's got to land somewhere, right, at verse 7? So it would definitely match up to verse uh, 
let's see right here, verse 5, where the raven could have just landed on one of the tops of the mountain, made a home over there. But remember, Noah wants to see the face of the ground dried at verse 8. At verse 8. So then the dove, uh, so there's no doubt the raven found some part of land, dry land to rest then. But the dove, you know, she could have landed on one of those tops of the mountain at verse 9. But uh, what the dove did is that she just returned unto him, Noah, into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So notice that the water, they still covered the face of the earth. Even though you could have had those tops of the mountain seen. Or it could be that the dove, when she went out to search for dry land, in her case compared to the raven, she didn't find dry land, whereas the raven did. Alright, so those are the possibilities there. Let's keep reading. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. So then uh, Noah took out his hand, let the whole, uh, not the Holy Spirit, let the dove land, took the dove, pulled that dove into him as they went inside the ark. Now that's a huge yeah. uh, sermon right there, yeah, and a huge good. picture right there. <laughs> yeah, I just gave a few answers already over there. Okay, uh, let me show you several passages on this, shall we? All right, uh, let's look at Ephesians 1 again. Ephesians 1. Now remember, the ark is a type of your salvation. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So then the ark is a type of your salvation. If the ark is a type of your salvation, notice the Bible says Noah pulled that dove inside the ark. So, that dove is representing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look at Matthew 3 as well. Matthew 3. We're going to look at two passages. Good, that Holy Spirit, what? Goes inside that ark. Yeah. That Holy Spirit, when you got saved, goes inside of you. Mm -hmm. That's what salvation does. Charismatics, they feel like they have to get the Holy Spirit back and forth, back and forth uh, all the time. No, you don't do that. Yeah, when right. you get saved, the Holy Spirit goes inside you. Amen. Not when you speak in tongues. When you get saved, the ark's the type of your salvation. The Holy Spirit goes inside you. Amen. All right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Notice that there is no doubt the dove is a type of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, what did the Holy Spirit take the form of? The Holy Spirit could have taken many other forms. But look at Matthew chapter 3. And notice the Bible says at verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, see that? Yeah. Descending like a dove yeah. and lighting upon him. That's what the Holy Spirit decided to take on. So there's no doubt about that. Now look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Notice at verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, so if ye got saved, what happened? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, that Holy Spirit. Notice that you got the Holy yeah, Spirit yeah. inside you. Uh, if you go back to Genesis 8, what did the Bible say? Noah gave his hand, and then he pulled and then took that dove inside the ark. Yeah. So how you get saved is you need to receive yeah, Christ. Amen. You need amen. to accept Christ. Amen. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Have you received Christ as your personal Savior, my friend? Amen. That's why we say that. Look at John chapter 1. I mean, that Holy Spirit can't go inside you unless you're willing to receive Him, unless you accept Him. Look at John chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 12. Verse 12. The Bible says, But as many as received Him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. If you receive Christ for your salvation, God uh, 
God equates that with believing. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, we look at that. If you believe on Him for salvation, what happens? The Holy Spirit goes inside of you. Alright, there's no doubt there's too many pictures on that one. Go back to Genesis 8 now. Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 10. Genesis chapter 8. And then we'll read verse 10. The Bible says, And he stayed yet other seven days. So then Noah, he just waited for seven more days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. Then he sent that dove out again. He sent forth that dove again outside of the ark to try to find dry land. Now, I don't know why, but I just find too many interesting numbers over here in the Bible concerning about, uh, there's so many sevens. Did you notice that? We studied that about uh, Noah already, that there were already uh, sevens mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then here we see uh, seven days here. We see seven days, seven days. So I don't know why. I don't know why the Lord uh, did that. I don't know why. I don't know why the Lord did uh, seven here. But we do know this is that uh, you can connect dots over here because remember seven is supposed to represent uh, com uh, perfection. Yeah. It's completed. Mm -hmm. It's completed. It's God's number. So notice that uh, Noah, when he was waiting, his waiting was completed. It's done. And then he sent forth the dove again. So I see a pattern too much over here throughout Scripture. There is no doubt that seven means completion. Mm -hmm. It means uh, God's number. So remember that. There's too many. Uh, this is a proof text when you look at Genesis 8.10 that seven should represent it's complete. It's done. Completion. There's too many verses on that. Verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening... So then notice that it's during evening time. The dove came into Noah, came to him. And lo, so lo means like lo and behold. So basically that's the idea. Like, uh, whoa. And lo in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So then in the mouth of the dove, lo and behold, whoa. <laughs> Take a look at this. An olive leaf. So that's what the dove plucked off. All right, you'll notice that your King James Bible has P-L-U-C-K-T. So it's like a past tense. That would save us a lot of handwriting if we went back to Old English, right? Instead of E-D, why not just put T in there, right? Just pronounces the same pretty much. All right. Olive leaf plucked off. So that olive leaf was in the mouth of the, whole, uh, of the dove. So that's important to understand. Notice that the Bible says that for the olive, when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is being typified by the dove here, is giving you an olive leaf, not an olive branch. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's an olive leaf, not an olive branch. Wait, don't say olive branch. Sometimes I might be guilty of saying that a few times. But make sure that you realize that it's a leaf, it's not a branch. You might say, why is that a big deal? Because the New Agers, they make a big deal about this uh, olive branch thing. And then they, uh, they're all into spirits. And then they tie olive branch to spirits right there. But that's not the Holy Spirit. It was an olive leaf. Mm -hmm. You'll notice those Roman pagan Caesars that they would have uh, wear those olive branches. So the Bible points out, no, it's not an olive branch. It's an olive leaf. It's an olive leaf. So notice that the King James Bible points that out very specifically. Okay, we're going to look at the last part of verse 11. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So then, because the dove brought in that olive leaf to Noah, he knew that, oh, the waters, they're reduced now. They're reduced, they're, from, they're off the earth. Now, look at verse 12. And he stayed yet other seven days. So he stayed seven more days. And sent forth the dove. He sent out the dove. 
So then you can tell that even though he knew at verse 11 that the waters that they were being reduced from off the earth, that, oh, so then there is dry ground, but the thing is, is that he doesn't know how much dry ground, obviously. Because you gotta realize, once he opens that door and the animal's cut loose, then he can't stop that. Yeah. And then what if there's like a deep level of water out there in front of him that he might drown? So then he needs to know if it's off completely, mm -hmm. okay? So atheists can't read again. So at verse 11, the atheist will assume, see, the Bible contradicted itself so many times that the waters were dry, the waters were dry, the waters were dry, but they don't understand right here that Noah at verse 11 and 12, he himself knew the waters were dry, but he also knew that did not mean that everything in the earth was completely dried off. There might be a huge, he might be on the ocean for crying out loud. We say that we're on, uh, the earth right now is dry, there's no doubt about it, but guess what? We've got like uh, several bodies of oceans out there, right? What if the, uh, we got a dry earth, but Noah was in the middle of an ocean? You thought about that? Yeah. See, so uh, we even say right now that we got dry land now. The, uh, Noah's flood has been dried off. But that don't mean there's no deep body of water out there. We got several bodies of oceans, mm -hmm. right? So see, atheists, they're not using common sense over here. They're just very nitpicky with words. Yeah. That's it. That's pretty much it. Okay, so Noah himself knew that the, there is dry ground, but he just don't know how much, see? Or if he's maybe in the middle of an ocean, who knows? Look at verse 12. And he stayed yet other seven days, so he stayed seven more days, and sent forth the dove. So he sent out the dove again. So it means completion again. Which return not again unto him anymore. Notice that the dove don't return to Noah anymore after that. So that proves over there that the, there must be dry land out there then. So then it's habitable. Okay, now here's the confusing part at verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year. Now notice at verse 13 it says, and it came to pass, right? That's a warning, because if you go back to Genesis 8, 6, remember it says, and it came to pass at the end of 40 days. So we don't know if this is giving another account again, all right? So it's giving another different account again. It's, it may not be just continuing the story. Mm -hmm. And when the Bible says, and it came to pass, we just don't know how much duration of time is there. So remember that. So that's a good rule for biblical hermeneutics that you might want to know. One of the metaphorical expressions, and it came to pass. You might want to know that. Once you see that, that's a warning sign of there's no, uh, there's no definite time. It's indefinite. It may not be in sequence. It may not be in order. It, the story might go backwards. It might jump 10 years in the forward. We just don't know. Okay? So let, and it came to pass, be a warning sign to you. So it came to pass, so it just so happened, what? In the 601st year. Okay, this is, uh, we got to write down these time periods, okay? Okay, so look at the clock here. You need to know your clock. All right, I'm going to have to move out of the way here. That way the people can see this. All right, it's the 601st year. First month, right? Notice first month, the first day of the month. That shows you how long Noah was in the ark. Go back to Genesis 7, Genesis 7, Genesis 7, and then we'll look at verse 11, verse 11, in the 600th year, not the 601st year, right? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, notice the flood, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So then, you notice that when Noah was 600 years old, that's when the flood came, but when he was 601, that's when the waters were drying off. Go back to Genesis 8.13. Genesis 8.13. 
the middle of verse 13, the waters were dried up from off the earth. So now the waters, they were dried up from off the earth now. The waters were drying off. And Noah removed the covering of the ark. So the ark had a covering. Okay. So uh, for some people who don't realize this, so you notice right here that this is uh, supporting one of the evidences that I pointed out to you that the details in Noah's Ark, not all of the details of the construction of Noah's Ark is given at Genesis 6. Remember that? I told you about that? Because there were some of the critics were saying, how can you, sur how can you survive with only one window in the Ark? How can they breathe? How can they survive? But the thing is, is that when you look at uh, Genesis uh, chapter 8 and verse 13, the covering was not mentioned either at Genesis chapter 6, the construction of Noah's Ark. So like I told you before in Genesis 6, God didn't give every single detail of what was constructed in Noah's Ark. Sure, there might be one window in Noah's Ark, but how do you not know that there were may maybe breathing holes or something that Noah made, right? So that's, so we don't, know all the details of Noah's Ark. There's a plenty of other things Noah could have added and built in there. So the Noah's Ark had a covering. Now this covering, uh, it can be seen in several other verses in the Bible. And we're going to look at several passages. I want you to go to Exodus 36 and Numbers 4. Numbers 4, Numbers 4, and Exodus 36. Exodus 36. We're going to look at Numbers 4 and Exodus 36. Now, the Bible talks about a covering, and then the Jews, they would call this, and in Hebrew, they would call this uh, Mixa, M-I-K-S-E-H, that's how you can pronounce it. Mix it. And the same Hebrew word can be found in other places in your Bible. Let's look at Exodus chapter 36, verse 19. Verse 19. The Bible says, And he made a covering for the tent of ram skin dyed red, and a covering of badger skins above that. So this covering that Noah used may have been some type of animal skin maybe. Here's another one. Let's look at Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4. And then we'll look at verse 8. Verse 8. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 8. And they shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet and cover the same with a covering of badger skins and shall put in the staves thereof. Look at verse 10. And they shall put it and all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger skins, and shall put it upon a bar. And upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue, and cover it with the covering of badger skins. Verse 12, And they shall take all the instruments of ministry, wherewith they minister in the sanctuary, and put them in a cloth of blue, and cover them with the covering of badger's skins. So, when we go back to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 8 again, what Noah may have used was a type, some type of animal skin that could have uh, overlaid some upper portion, uh, some open portion in the upper deck. So Noah may have made some type of opening over here. So he may have, who knows, he may have made some type of opening over here uh, in the upper deck. It could be at the end over here. And then he just covered it down with uh, badger skins over here. So for all we know, right? So for all we know. So it's some type of covering that Noah had. So you can see then right here that they had plenty of oxygen then. So remember, Noah had only one window, right? So then the critics will say, well, he can't breathe. So who knows? It could be over there. Or it could be that this one window, which could have been here, may have been a little bit upper. Maybe the window may have been upper. Who knows? So the window may not have been like this. It may have been over here, something that's upper, and then you get your covering over here of the skins, for all we know. 
So who knows? It could be either or. It could be either or. But the point is, is that there was an open portion, and then there was a covering. And then when Noah, he opened up the covering, he was able, and look, behold, the face of the ground was dry. So he's able then to look down. So wherever this thing is located, where it's located, this upper portion is where Noah, he could see the bottom of the ground where he's at then, over here. If you recall, back at Genesis chapter 8, the tops of the mountains were seen, right? So the ark was resting on the top of Ararat, right? If we look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, right? Genesis 8, 4. So that's the part that Noah could have been looking over here. The face of the ground dry over here at Ararat. So the top of the mountains. However, he couldn't get out yet because of uh, verse 14. Verse 14. So there's still, the waters are still being dried off. So Noah, he may have, uh, like I told you before, he might look at over here at his part of the ground and he might see the tops of the mountains, but that's the point. It's only the tops of the mountain. He doesn't know yet if the earth is still, you can inhabit it yet. Right. Because it still may be deep portions over there. Right. Okay, let's go to verse 14. The second month, so now he stays longer now. He has to stay another month. In the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month. So the twenty-seventh day of that second month was the earth dry. So now the earth is dry at the second month, twentieth day, twenty-something, seventh day of the month. All right, now here's the thing here. Then let's look at all these passages then, Okay. So it may be, if we're going to go in chronological order on how the timing works, this is how it could work. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, it could be over here that that's when the flood happened, right? 600th year of Noah's life, second month, 17th day of the month. So that's when the flood started. Then you go 40 days and 40 nights. Then what happens after that, is the Bible says the water prevailed at Genesis 7, 24 upon the earth 150 days. So prevail means it's all over the earth, okay? So the waters were still out there for about 150 days long. It's deep. Then notice that it started to dry, okay, at verse 3. Genesis chapter 8, verse 3, all right? The water started to reduce. They were abated. They were reducing, Okay? After the end of the 150 days. Then, uh, notice over here, it was going to the 7th month, 17th day of the month. Okay? So it's going on to over here. It's going on to the uh, 7th month on the 17th day of the month. Uh, the mountains of Ararat that you're seeing it. The, uh, the tops of the mountains seen. Then at verse 6 and onward, okay, sometime after the 40 days of rain, right, then Noah, he sent out those two birds. And then finally we reach at verse 13, the 601st year. And then he just waited a bit longer and then the second month he finally got off. Okay, so it can go in that order. Uh, that's how I calculated in my timing. But then Dr. Rockman, he gives a different timing on the commentary. Because remember, of Genesis 8, verse 6, and Genesis 8, verse 13, it goes, it came to pass, right? So meaning different accounts. Uh, notice the way that I gave to you was kind of like in sequence. You notice that over there? But then over here, it could be just different accounts. So what could be the case then, and how Dr. Rockman perceives it, is that Genesis chapter 8, verse 1 through 5, is one account over there, okay? And then uh, when we look at uh, verse 6, Genesis 8, 6, he claims that when Noah opened the window of the ark, this would match up with Genesis chapter 8 and verse 13, when he reached the 601st year that's when Noah sent out those two birds and opened the window. Why? Because he moved the covering of the ark. See that? So when Noah opened that window, at the same time, he was moving the covering. Mm -hmm. So this might be 
the window, uh, so this covering may be like this more than this, if Dr. Upman is right about that. So that might be the case. Well then, if that's the case, and that means Noah was, uh, he didn't send out those two birds until he was waiting almost a year, right? Because remember, he was 600 years old when the flood came. And then the Bible says in Genesis 8, 13, 600 and first, that's when he started to open and send out the birds. So then it's almost a year then, that time. So he was just waiting inside uh, under lockdown for a year. And we yeah. cry and whine about our lockdowns, <laughs> right? Yeah, come on, brother. So we see here that he was being locked down. And then second month, 7th and 20th day of the month, then the earth was dry over there. So then the earth was dry. But then we come across a problem again when we are to read uh, verses uh, 4 and 5, right? Verse 4 and 5. Uh, it says here, 17th day of the month, waters decreased, right? The waters were abating. So it's at 17th day of the 7th month, right? And then you go over here at verse 13, it's at the first month, the first month, the first day of the month that the waters were being dried off from the earth. So then there would be a contradiction over here. But then uh, it, uh, it could be then, it could be the case where, I don't know what he has in mind, but it could be that Genesis 6, 13 and 14, when he was staying there a year, up to the first month and the second month, it wasn't at the second month that uh, he got off the ark. It was where you reached verse 4 and 5. So at verse 5, it's at the 10th month then he got out. So remember, uh, I told you in, in my point of view, uh, in my timing, that's the second month he got off, right? But then... It could be, from Dr. Upton's perspective, what he's looking at is the tenth over here that he got out. Right. So it's at the tenth. Which means then, if Noah was there 600 first year of the first month, right? So that's a year. And then you add the second month after that, right? Then you go all the way to the tenth month. He was longer than a year then. Yeah. He was longer than a year inside Noah's Ark. So that could be the case. But then you got a contradiction here, which the atheists would like to use, is that if you look at verse 14, it says the 7 and 20th day of the month was the earth dry, right? So it seems to show here that the earth got dried off at verse 14, the second month then. Not at the 10th when Noah got out, right? So it's at the second month. So then there's a contradiction to Scripture. So uh, either my, uh, my timing might be correct, or it could be this. The simple answer to that is, this ain't the first time the Bible said that the earth was being dried up. You saw too many times that the Bibles were talking about, like Genesis 8, yeah. uh, 3, and then Genesis uh, 8, 13, dry, dry, dry. It mentioned too many times that it was dry, 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 but it wasn't completely dry. Mm -hmm. See that? It wasn't completely dry. So it's just that some parts that Noah was seeing was being dried off. So yeah, the earth may be dry, but like I told you before, we don't know that if Noah was in the middle of an ocean then maybe, right? So maybe the, maybe you can even get the whole earth, uh, you can get the earth dried where you can get even nine-tenths of it dry. So you can call that a dried earth. So the flood is done undoubtedly, but what if that one-tenth part of the body of water is where Noah's ark is at, yeah. right? Yeah. See, like I told you before, a great example is like right now, we're in a dried earth now. Noah's flood is done. But we got like uh, several oceans out there. What if your ark was in the middle over there on top of one of those mountains, right? So it's not safe to get out. So Noah had to wait for the waters to abate and dry off from off the mountains mm -hmm. of Ararat. Which is what it says right here at verse uh, 4, 3 and 4. The waters had to abate from off the mountains of Ararat. So then uh, Dr. Ruffman's uh, timing over here, 
there's no contradiction. It can match. Mm -hmm. But you can also go by my timing over here. I just don't know which one's which. Which one's which. It may be more logical to say Dr. Upman's. The reason why is because it wouldn't make sense. You have to wait a much longer length of time for the flood to really decrease. Okay? So his point of view might make more sense. So you can see I am a very humble teacher. I will admit that my point of view could be wrong. Okay, let's... No, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. All right. I'm just joking. All right, let's look at verse 15. Let's look at verse 15. All right, then. Notice right here, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. So now notice that um, at verse 14, we're just going to go by my timing here to make the commentary easier, okay? So if after that second month, the earth was finally dried off, then that's when God told Noah, he spoke to him, hey, go forth of the ark. So get out of the ark. You, your wife, your sons, your sons' wives, let them all go out with you. So, that's, so when God commanded Noah, he went out of the ark. That's important to understand. What's so important to understand is that when we look at, this is so interesting, at Genesis chapter 8, verse 7 through 12, he sent out the birds to see signs of dry land, and even though those birds came, uh, even though the dove came back and then he realized the earth is dry, he didn't get off the ark. He stayed in the ark. You'll notice at verse 13, the face of the ground was dry, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 14, the earth dried, right? So, this is amazing. If Dr. Upman's timing is right then, at verse 14, that the second month, it was dry, but then he didn't get out until, if uh, Dr. Upman believes this, that the tenth month, that's when they got out. Mm -hmm. So he stayed in that ark much longer. You know what? That's a good. That shows again how obedient Noah was. That's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. That is so important. He didn't go by his own assumption. Mm -hmm. He went by the direct command of God. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Bible, uh, remember I showed you verses on that. The Bible says Noah did accordingly to all that the Lord commanded him. Now, this is a good lesson for anybody in common sense life. It is very dangerous to go by what you assume. Right. Don't go by assumptions like, well, it's okay to do this yeah. because I'm, uh, it seems to be that way. No, when you uh, are under somebody, under somebody's command, the, one of the most dangerous things is to go by assumption. You, you can't go by what seems the most logical and what works out. You have to be directly under the command of what the leader says, and that's what Noah did. Amen. Amen. That's a good sign of obedience. You can't just assume, oh, God, you know, will understand. No, you got to go by the word of God. Amen. You can't Amen. assume that your worship service must be a great worship service if you're not sure that it can contradict Scripture. Amen. Because the Scripture can contradict your type of worship service. Right. Yeah. No matter how you feel or what you experience. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem with churches today. They think they're right with God. Why? They don't go directly by the command of God in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And they assume that Jesus would love it. Why? Because why would you say no to this? Well, how do you not know God would say no to that? Come on. He wants to see obedience, not sacrifice. Obedience is yep. better than sacrifice. That's right. you got to remember that. Yep. But that's also very helpful for you in a church ministry. What's so important in a church ministry is to not go by assumption. you got to see if your ministry leader, if that's what he wants, and you got to always wait. for the, Noah waited five months, if that's true. If this is true, he waited five months for permission and won't go without the permission of his leader. That is extremely important. That will help you even in work as well. So it is very important that this is a good example about obedience and following leadership Amen. and to not go by assumption. You can learn a lot from this passage right Amen. here. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 17. Verse 17. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee. So God tells Noah, everything that's alive, bring it with you. Of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That, uh, so Noah, uh, God says to Noah, bring all flesh with you. 
And notice the phrase both, which doesn't mean two, it means including, right? Including what? Bird, cattle, you know, livestock, anything that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth. God wants them to breed abundantly all over the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So God is telling these animals that they, He wants them to be fruitful, to produce more fruit, and to multiply, spread out, to increase all over the earth. Hmm. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife. So Noah, notice right here, Noah went, went forth. He went out. His sons and Noah's wife and his sons' wives with him. They all went out with him. Finally, they went out the ark. Including what? Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds. So every beast, anything that creeps, and any bird, and I like what the Bible says, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth. So anything out there that creeps. So he repeated it again at verse 19, which shows, which I don't know how many of you would like this passage, but, uh, you know, these people cry about, you know, protecting the animals, you know, I'm an animal lover. But you know what, they're sooner, of, uh, they're sooner of a hypocrite because they don't really care about animal life because when there's an annoying fly or a cockroach in their ki kitchen, you know what they do? They kill it without hesitation. Yeah. And they say, you're disgusting, you're gross. You're an animal hater right there. Yeah. How about that, yeah. all right? Yeah. These guys are just hypocrites with the way they act. They want to pick their type of animals. Yeah. See that? But God, He's not discriminatory just yeah. like those liberals. They're very discriminatory people. They say, we're working on not being discriminatory. They're, they're very discriminatory yeah. people, you notice that. So you can catch them on their hypocrisy on that. But God, He's not discriminatory with the animals right here. He repeats again, I mean every little insect out here. I want them to multiply. Yes, the cockroaches, the bugs, and all this. All God's creatures, great and small. He created them, you got to understand. So, uh, yeah, but, that's, but the Lord created them too. The Lord created yeah. them too. So uh, God wanted them to multiply and spread out. Amen. All right. So we can see right here, God is very more compassionate than you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we can look at an example over here of how much God really cares about his creation. Go to the book of Matthew. Let's look at the book of Matthew. This is a famous passage on how much God cares for his creation. And it should encourage you. If God cares for these small little things, oh. how much more would He care about you? Mm -hmm. So see, He cares about all of His creation, but He has different levels of care. Mm -hmm. See, that's the liberal's distorted mindset. Their distorted mindset is, we should care about everything out there, but you can't, uh, you can't live successfully that way. Yes, there is care, but there are different levels of care. Yeah, yeah. That's why God told mankind to what? Dominate the earth. That's why He allowed eating of animals and etc. Why? Because there are different levels that He would put the care. He prioritizes humans way more. And when you prioritize a dog and a cat more than a human, then you ought to be ashamed of yourself, actually. Yeah, yeah. There are, I mean, you got like... Uh, uh, the Obamas, where they would like pay out uh, a first-class ticket for their pet dog, where it would have air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you're just really stretching. This is the kind of world that we live in nowadays. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at Matthew. Notice how much Jesus Christ, He cares about His creation at chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 6, excuse me. Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Notice right here, in verse 26, verse 26. Mm -hmm. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. How about that? He feeds those birds. Yeah. Are ye not much better than they? You're better than they are. Look at verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 30. Even the blade of grass. Verse 30. Wherefore if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. See, God realizes that vegetation, animal life can die out, but He can take care of them too. But look at this. Shall He not much more clothe you, 
O ye of little faith. Yes, we just have very little faith in God. That's just our problem. We just don't really believe in his care and power. Look, he really truly cares about his creation. The evidence is he has a deeper heart than the liberals about how he cares about those creepy, disgusting little insects. How about that? So, you don't believe God really loves you? That he really cares for you? Even when things are cast into the oven, as the Bible says, do you really doubt how much he truly cares for you? Come on, Pastor. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. And then uh, I think what I'll do is I will close it here. I will end it here because this might take a little, five more minutes, but I only have two minutes, so I'll end it here. So 2021, it's a good... Uh, I'm going to tell you and teach you how you can get on God's good side. There's something what you can do where you can get on God's good side and show you favoritism and blessing. And how you do that is you give me a million dollars. No, that's not that. <laughs> we want that for our church building, amen? So y'all pray for that one. I will love you if you give me a million dollars, though, you know, so you can get a church building. Nice one. But the thing is, is that the point is, is that at verse 20 through 21, there is a way how you can get on God's favor. All right, and I'll teach you that. And you can do it. You can even do it right now. You just don't practice it. That's the thing. I'll teach you how to do that in the next chance to study. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers, that we've increased our knowledge of the Scriptures and understood more about your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.